Welcome to Flip Your Lid with Kim Honeycutt. Kim is a psychotherapist and executive director of ICU Talks, a mental health speaking ministry. This is a podcast about how to flip your lid and learning how to reconnect to who you really are. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining Flip Your Lid. I've got a friend of mine here today. His name is Adam Fidel. He is a great guy. He's joining us. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him, and then we're going to hear from him. He's going to share some of his expertise with us. Adam Mortz is a licensed marriage and family therapist in North and South Carolina, is a clinical director and supervisor for the Corner Institute for Transformation. You can find that in countertransformation.com and an adjunct professor at Pfeiffer University. The team at the Corner focuses on treating marriage crisis, addiction, trauma, unwanted, and that's the key word in this, everybody, unwanted same-sex attraction, family bonding, premarital therapy, and transformational coaching. Adam also leads seminars to help married couples create healthy strategies for long-term success for the families and has hosted events to help unmarried people date in healthy ways. He was born in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, which is where we are, when he was nine years old. Adam navigated his way through a chaotic home life, drug use in his teens, and he barely made it out of high school. He found purpose in his first love, which is basketball, which led to a four-year coaching job after his high school graduation. His dream to coach college basketball was interrupted by Encounter with God in 2005, which changed his entire life trajectory. Adam moved to Los Angeles in 2008. And over the course of eight years, he worked with disabled young adults, young adults coming out of juvenile centers who were being taken into charter schools, and also those in the California state prison system and mental health treatment facilities. He and his family moved back to Charlotte five years ago, where Adam has focused to grow the corner of a community-focused institution. He earned his master's in marital and family therapy from Fuller Theological Seminary. He met his wife, Tanil, in Los Angeles at Mosaic Church, which is amazing. Yep. And together they have three children. Well, y'all please welcome Adam Fidel, therapist, to Flip Your Lid. Hey, Adam. Hello, Kim, and hello, everybody. It's good to be here. Yeah, I'm so glad you're here. So I know you have a lot of different expertise in different ways, and there's so much you're going to bring to the table today. So everybody just to sit tight and just chew whatever part of this meal he's about to he's about to feed you. So, but you know, Adam. You know, we all start in the same place on this podcast and just want you to think for a second. Tell us about what life event or experience flipped your lid and what measures did you have to take to reconnect to who God says you are? Sure. So I've, I've thought about that question because I've listened to your podcast. And so right. I know. Thank you for listening. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I've been thinking about that a lot, actually, because, uh, you know, I think there's there's obviously marked events, right? Like there's, there's significant events that everybody pulls from, but I was thinking through the kind of trajectory of how I got into doing this work. Um, And it was really, I I could see how it evolved from my childhood. Uh, I grew up in a fairly uh, chaotic, my father struggles with alcohol, Mm. uh, you know, parents, codependence and all the things that come with that. And um, it, it was never really secure. Uh, I never feel I'm, I'm one of four. I have three other siblings. I have a twin sister as well. Mm. Um, and so just being in that environment for a long time, uh, you know, you gain some strengths out of being in that environment. Uh, and there's also some things that obviously have a negative impact. And uh, so as I was going through uh, high school, uh, I had a lot of resentment, uh, honestly, towards my dad um, and towards my mom, but that came later. I didn't realize that until later. Um, cause that was a little bit, uh, so, uh, I th- thought it would be wise because I really despised what drinking or alcohol brought into the family. Um, and this is, you know, the mind of a 13, 14, 15 year old kid, which is, you know, not a good starting ground for right. wisdom. Um, I thought it would be smarter. Well, if I'm, so I don't become like that, uh, I'll just use drugs. So I somehow made sense in my mind that, well, uh, at least I won't become something that I at the time hated. Um, so I went down that path, got into a lot of trouble. So I'd say one of the moments that really flipped my lid, um, when I was younger, uh, I actually ended up getting arrested, uh, when I was eight, uh, 17. And so that was a kind of a big shift, like wake up call, like, Mm -hmm. all right, like this is not going in a positive direction. Like, 
Uh, I was barely making it through high school. I barely went to high school most days, honestly. Um, and that, that was uh, a significant shift for me. Uh, really kind of stopped a lot of the using at that point, except for maybe, you know, smoking marijuana every once in a while. Uh, and then I had an opportunity to, to get on the coaching. It's a long story, uh, but I ended up coaching at my high school for four years. And I think in a positive that flipped my lid because, you know, there's something about, well, my life just a year before, a few years before wasn't going in the right direction. Um, and here I am now I've got an opportunity to coach young men who I was actually in school with the year before. So Mm -hmm. it was an interesting, it was at my high school. So it was, they were familiar with me to some degree. And, um, but really the kind of the conviction of like, all right, well, if I'm going to have any kind of legitimate influence with these young people, uh, in their lives, then I should probably get my act together. Uh, and I still look back at those four years. Uh, it was a South Mac high school. Um, four of the most full years I would say that I had because I was able to spend time with young men who were, you know, I coached guys that were freshmen all the way to when they graduated. Mm. And that's a really unique experience. So that was uh, a moment that flipped my lid. And then, uh, you know, I had a pretty, a negative, I guess another negative, uh, was in love with this girl, kind of broke my heart. That was my heartbreak when I was, uh, 21, 22, 21, um, had an encounter with God, uh, long story. I'll get to share this maybe another time with you. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, I just, I audibly heard God tell me that my life wasn't my own in the midst Mm -hmm. of the breakdown. Uh, and that woke me up. Um, uh, I didn't know what to do with it for a while, but, uh, I kind of figured it out and, that started, uh, that was in 2004 to 2005. And that, that's, that year is a big, big year for me in terms of, I think, emotional transition or emotional health, psychological health, spiritual health. Mm. Um, and then uh, I'll mention this because it was another, it's unfortunately negative, but after I moved to Los Angeles in 2008, uh, the, uh, a young lady that I had been dating was murdered. Wow. I'm so sorry, Evan. That's horrible. Yeah, it was, it was, it was hard. Um, you know, and I say that because that I look at the, well, how did I end up getting into the work of therapy? Right. I, when I went, went to Los Angeles, I didn't even know what a marriage and family therapist was. I'd never heard of it. I went to school counselor, you know, obviously there was some, some links between the fields, but, um, it was, kind of really confronting that loss along with kind of the history of the chaos um, in my, I guess, mid to late twenties uh, it, that it at least kind of propelled me into uh, grad school in California. Um, so I, I look at the kind of the pathway, there's a handful of uh, positive and negative events that I would say flip my lid. Yeah, that's a, there was a lot to unpack in that. So thank you for sharing that very much. I just want to, I want to bookmark God saying your life is not your own because you know you you could extrapolate on that for sure. twelve hours, I'm sure. So I want to come back to that, but I want to go to this. I just need to know this. What did you get arrested for? Uh, DUI. Okay. All right. So and that was a turning point for you. It was, and I just to be clear, I mean, I'm not advoc- I'm not justifying it. Uh, it was just because I was underage. I barely had anything in my system. It wasn't like I was driving around. I had yeah. a beer, and but I was 17, so it doesn't matter, right? It's illegal, so. Right, yeah, no, very understandable. understandable. And I, I've been arrested for DUI, so there, there's absolutely yeah. no judgment. It's part of my curiosity. I mean, someone else been arrested who's in this field. Sure. Yeah. Because, I mean, so much, there, there is a correlation of our trauma, and especially developmental trauma, and going into addiction. And, sure. and the question becomes, like, what wakes us up? Mm-hmm. Like, what's the wake-up call for us? And so, mm-hmm. and for a lot of people, getting arrested is not it. And for you, it just seems substantial. So I completely understand that. And that's why I just want to check in about, did that get your dad to come beside you and help you? Did it somehow, did it help at all within your family relationships? Uh, that's a good question. I know my gut response is, no, things probably got worse. <laughs> really? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, so that was 17. And so 
at that point in my life, you know, the family system had already kind of deteriorated mm-hmm. quite a bit. So um, things didn't really get better. And I wouldn't even say they're really healthy. I mean, I'm, uh, I don't want to put my family on the spot right now, but yeah. Um, you know, you can see things once you get out of a system that you can't see when you're in the system. Very true. Very right. True. So, so I think there was part of me getting out of that system. I moved out, uh, when I started coaching at South Mac, I went to central Piedmont for two years and then I transferred to UNC Charlotte. And so then I had, I, I had moved out on my own. So I started to create some separation, but my parents actually ended up divorcing, um, I guess officially that next year was when my dad left our home. Gotcha, so gotcha. that I would say that's not a positive, but I think that, you know, it, it, it added a different kind of chaos into the home when he was mm-hmm. gone. Right. So, mm-hmm. or uncertain. so yeah. And, and there's an invisibility that happens for a lot of us within the family yeah. system, within our homes. And so part of the addiction brings some visibility, but it doesn't mean you get seen. Correct. All right. Yep. And so it sounds like, Part of what you're elaborating on is is not being seen, but you you figured out how to see yourself and then learn that God was seeing you. Yeah, and I, you know, I found the 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 basketball really helped me form a, at that time a, a significant part of my identity. Right? I mean, I, I had purpose. I was in school. I worked at Harris Teeter for ten years through all of that, which is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess for those of you that aren't in Charlotte might not know what Harris Teeter is. It's a grocery store, but right. um, so that gave me something to, to kind of give myself to, but also be responsible for. Right. So um, when I look back on my life in terms of the, the spiritual relationship, I remember, I don't think I, I never believed that there wasn't a God Mm -hmm. Right. It wasn't something that was presented to me in what I now know to be, you know, Christian faith or Jesus like that came when I was 22. Um, And when I really started to understand and have something to it helped inform who I was becoming, uh, but also helped me make sense of a lot of my life prior to that. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. how, How did you reconcile? Because all of us subconsciously and sometimes consciously you know, our earthly father gets very blended with our heavenly father, with our idea, with our image. I mean, initially, our image of God is our image of God. It doesn't even mean that's who God is. It's who we believe authority is, who we believe the father would be. And so for you to have difficulty with your father, even though we know he's struggling with addiction, did the best he could, it still was your idea of a sure. father. How did, what did you do to transform that and let God be God? Yep, that's a great question. I, you know, when I look at, um, I, I think I was very fortunate to have other men. So I, I think at a core level, I'll start, I'll slow down a little bit. I think at a core level, I knew that whatever I was experiencing or that my siblings were experiencing growing up, that there was something that was greater beyond that. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know how I knew that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I knew that I didn't believe that God was, you know, um, uh, mean and dominant and controlling. And I don't know how I knew that, but I sensed that. And then I had the chance when I was coaching, uh, I just got to coach with other men that were years older than me, right? They were more mentors than they would be father figures to some degree, Mm -hmm. but they kind of embodied a completely different kind of person, right? So like they showed me love, they gave me opportunities to influence other young people. They, they mm-hmm. gave me correction where I needed correction. They mm-hmm. gave me, and it wasn't, it was never, it was never mean, right. It was never uh, demeaning or manipulative or anything like that. But there is one relationship after my encounter with God that, that had a huge impact uh, on me. Uh, he was the um, best man in our wedding, but he was 11 years older than me. And that, you know, I guess that's another flip your lid moment too. This family that, uh, took me in, in a sense, uh, it was the first time they, they completely, um, I was able to reimagine and actually see what healthy family looked like. Mm -hmm. So I spent hours with them. I mean, I would just hang out out there at their home with their kids. And, um, 
again, he ended up becoming the best man in my wedding. Yeah, it's uh, beautiful. Their adopted son has his middle name is Adam. I mean, it's a, it, it's a big, so that, that was a big shift as well. Just being able to have literally witness and be a part of a healthy family. Mm-hmm. Was that your first visualization or experience of the idea of like, maybe I could have this too. Maybe I could create this myself because now you experienced it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It, and, and he, it wasn't just that he was allowed. I mean, he was, you know, I mean, you could call it discipling me or mentoring me or, I mean, he, but he was also just a friend. He was just, you know, at times he was a brother, at times he was like a father figure, at times he was a spiritual mentor, at times mm-hmm. he was like, he kind of covered all of that. Right. Uh, and we just, we spent again, hours together. Yeah. Uh, that's that's so amazing. Had, yeah. It was, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. And that, so I want to go back to that. You had someone you were dating who very sadly got, got murdered and, and that this happened once you're already in a relationship with, with God, it happened after that. Yes. Yeah, can you talk a little bit? Because I know a lot of us have this idea, and it's it's naive and it's juvenile, but I, I had it that once I accepted Jesus, my Lord and Savior, my life would go well. Sure. And nothing biblical about that. No. Nothing. It, it's not it doesn't make any sense, and yet we hang on to that. And we have this idea if something bad happens, it's because we didn't read our Bible enough. Something bad happens because we didn't do. We make it about ourselves and the wrong the wrong self, right? So sure. just curious, was you sound like you're at this point a baby Christian? Horrible horrible tragedy happens. How do you deal with that? How do you internally reconcile a relationship with this new God you're just learning about and some tragic happening? Sure. Yeah. So in my, in my mind and in my relationship with God at the time, I don't, I knew that it wasn't him that did that. Hmm. Right. I think we also have this dilemma as well, where it might be one way of thinking where, well, if you turn your life over to God, that everything goes well. Yep. But the counter to that, too, that I come across often is like, well, um, things aren't going the way that I want them and it's God's fault. True. It's like, well, but but there's a whole nother force in the world that doesn't want things to be good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So I, I think knowing that that exists well, it's, um, you know, I don't think God doesn't desire for anyone to die, but people make really really poor choices and are psychologically or uh, developmentally in really dark places. Right. And, and so, you know, when that happened, uh, I think I understood that from a a kind of a larger perspective, how I handled it is a different story. Uh, I didn't talk about it with anybody for a long time. Mm. Um, I had friends in Los Angeles that I had gotten to know that, were aware that it had happened. Um, but it wasn't something that I was willing to engage for a long time. I was ashamed. Uh, I'll, I'll just say that our relationship was not very healthy, even though I was, you know, in this relationship with God. Um, and so I carried some guilt with that. Uh, never guilt with, should I have done more or could I have done more? I mean, I was 3000 miles away, right? So she was here in North Carolina. I was in California. So it wasn't that, but it was really just the shame. But I think that shame was also, I hadn't really started to dig into like more historical shame from my childhood. Right. So like you right. kind of yeah. you bring all that together and it. Yeah. So um, initially I didn't handle it well. I didn't even want to talk about it. Right. Sure. Well, let's talk about the historical shame that silenced us, right? Sure. We know that's one thing that the, the, the enemy wants for us as part of the supernatural battle is, is to suffer silently. Sure. And so to to totally make sense, if you have a history of shame, that you don't know it's okay to have a voice. You don't know if it's, we have to feel safe to have a voice. Sure. And so can you just elaborate whether it's your personal historical shame or it's just in general as a therapist, you want to give some knowledge about that? Yeah, well, so I, I have this thought um, around the idea of, of being ashamed. Uh, I, I don't, I believe it's true. Um, that you can't in a moment know that you're fully loved by God and at the same time be ashamed of who you are. Mm, It's good. Yeah. Right. So I think what that, I think safety, yes, but I think what's even more necessary, even in a therapeutic setting is, is trust and courage. Mm. Right. So I think it's important that, that we learn to act out of 
wanting to be courageous and confront the things that are mm -hmm. painful, overwhelming, have caused suffering, have relational trauma, physical trauma, whatever they may be. They're mm -hmm. not easy things to do. Um, but, but when you do that, when you expose them, right, if you're willing to expose them, then they legitimately lose their power. Like I have ownership over my story. Yeah. Right. So I can share it with you and I can share it with other people. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not ashamed of anything that's happened in my life. Right. Right. So shame, like you said, will silence us. Mm -hmm. Right. But as soon as you start to just be honest and truthful with yourself and act with some courage and trust and find people that, that act trustworthy yeah. um, and that are strong, then you kind of start opening yourself up or shedding these things. And then they, you look at it from a new perspective right? It doesn't define me anymore the way that it did. Cause shame, it, yeah. it's it, right. Yeah. It, it tells you you're unworthy or you're unlikable or you're worth yep. nothing. Or, yep. Where it's when I separate myself, it's, it's a part of my story. It's not who I am. Mm -hmm. Is there, can you, is there a piece of that that you want to throw out there for us? I just think about when I did my fist up, and in AA, fourth and step, fifth step, fourth step is really writing out your secrets and your resentments. And the fifth step is sharing it with one person and sharing it with God. And and just knowing how big everything was in my head. And actually saying it, getting out there, it became proportional. And mm -hmm. it was never as, outside of childhood, certain certain abuse parts, which always can feel big. But the usually things that we do to someone else, it feels so shameful. Sure. All right. Something we're involved in. And, and so is there something along those lines you recall that like you, once you said it, it just became, you saw it so differently. It, it became proportional at that time. Hmm. It's a good question. Um, I don't know. I don't know, actually. Um, I don't know if there was a moment that stands out where I, You know, I, I think the core of, well, in that specific relationship with this young woman, right? I was ashamed at the way that I had acted from a sexual standpoint with her, mm -hmm. knowing that that wasn't the right way to treat someone that I wasn't married to, right? right. So I, I, a lot of that was where some of the shame in that relationship yeah. anchored itself. Right. Um, part of it was just the fear. I think there was just fear too of just, talking about the fact that to voice, right? So, I mean, it used to be very difficult to say I used to date someone who was murdered. Mm -hmm. Like that's not mm -hmm. like just using that language. I remember early on was very like, it would like, it would almost like fumble out of my mouth. Right. right? It, right. it, um, You know, ironic, not ironically at all. In seventh grade, my best friend's brother was also murdered. And I was there when that happened. So. Yeah. So you were there the, when your best friend's brother was murdered. He was, I was with him the night that it happened. And I was at the hospital with him. Wow. When wow. Yeah. So yeah. that was yeah. in seventh grade. So mm -hmm. like there's, um, you know, I think too, I, the family situation, uh, I have images and I, and I started to piece some of this together. I had images of, of being, I don't know how young I was. I would say under three is the image that I have. And, okay. um, of really just desperately needing or wanting somebody to come and like pick me up. And I was crying, but, but, but nobody ever coming. Now, I don't know if that's because, you know, it's hard to make sense of our, sometimes our memories are not very accurate. Um, but I think that kind of encapsulates the idea of just, uh, either not feeling loved or wanted, but also not being able to say or voice what I need. Right? Yes. So like, I, I think that comes all the way to when I was 25 and this event happened. And I just, I didn't know how or what to say about it. Yeah, that's really huge. And in, in just bringing up the silence we have around emotional needs, because then I want to shift into you being a marriage and family therapist, which is so vital, you know, in this world. But just knowing and teach people all the time, like if you get shamed for your emotional needs and you're no longer allowed to receive and you have to hyper focus on someone else's needs. Sure. Then the limitation in the relationship is tremendous. Sure. Tremendous. And yeah. so that's part of why 
we can't say the past is the past. Our, our childhood is very significant what happens in marriages. And so just knowing the struggle for your emotional needs, which is part of where addiction comes in, it becomes your voice. In that now to go into a marriage and to have seen a ha- healthy family, to have a mentor and other people as a father figure and, and to have some success and to go into a marriage and still know subconsciously we pick somebody who will represent some of our pain. Sure. And so just talking a little bit about your emotional needs and how you've worked on letting it be okay that you have them and how to have voice around them in a non-critical way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so when I, if I bring all of that to my marriage with my wife, um, you know, I had done a whole ton of work before I met her. I I don't think I would have um, been in a place to meet her and actually move the relationship forward had I not done a lot of work. I mean, we met, you don't know how, I'm 38. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I know that most people think I'm much, much younger. Uh, But so my wife and I didn't meet and uh, we met when we were 29. Right. So I spent um, a good portion of those years up to meeting her uh, really trying to work on um, you know, the stuff that I was bringing with me from, from, you know, and working out my parents' stuff and my sibling stuff. And, um, but then to also know that, uh, you know, it's really important, I think, from a marital perspective, and I say this quite a bit with clients, is yes, your spouse might have some, embody some of the personality traits or the uh, attachments, like whichever direction you want to go of your mm-hmm. parents but they aren't your parents, right? Like it's really important to remember that. And I'm, I have tendencies maybe of my dad and of my mom, but I'm not my dad and I'm not my right. mom. Right. But, and so I think that comes along with forming your, that identity, that independent identity, but also the identity that you have with God, right? If you continue to work those things out, and I think my wife had done the same um, in her life individually. And we're still working on it, obviously, up until we met. Um, yeah. What have you, what have you noticed about needing to be seen by her, needing her, needing to feel respected by her? Like, is, do you feel like you're at a place that that comes up where it's proportional that it's what's in the marriage and it's not like residue from your traumatic childhood? Uh, at this point, no, I, I don't think it is right. I, I think that that comes through. Um, my wife and I, I think, have done a really good job of learning how to share our emotional needs with each other, like learning how to be vulnerable with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we're both very practical people, so uh, and very structured people. So um, when there's something that uh, is off or there's a gap or we're not in a healthy place. Uh, and I was talking about this earlier with a couple that I was working with. I think something that I've learned in my own marriage is like the, the space, if there's a gap between you and people that you love and it's negative or it's, um, we'll just say it's negative to keep it simple, uh, to learn to hate that negative gap, right? Mm-hmm. So like if I have an, me and my wife are in a conflict or something like that, like if I wake up and we're on opposite sides of the bed and there's this distance between us, like I've really consciously learned to hate that. Like it's not her, it's the space that's keeping us from actually being vulnerable and loving each other well. Mm -hmm. Um, And providing a place where we both can, can actually act courageously and share what we need and want. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's really has become this, anything that's going to be in the way between you and I or, or our children, that's like something's off, something's not right. Right. This isn't the way that I want to treat my family or be treated. Like we're going to go after it. I think that's why I think of it as courage. Uh, I think more than safety is because there's a being able to pursue like whatever it takes to close that gap because I, I I've seen what that gap does if you let it exist for a long period of time between people and it's not good. Right. It's like the unspoken between you and somebody. It's like mm-hmm. somebody's got to go, somebody's got to move towards a relationship in a way 
that starts to, to reconcile and get that out of the way. Mm-hmm. Like it won't. And so I, you know, part of it's having a mindset um, to do that. And I, you know, how exactly to help people married couples recognize, I mean, I, people know there's a gap in a marriage. Like, you know, mm-hmm. when you're disconnected from people that you love mm-hmm. or it's not what you, you want. Right. Right. And so people have a hard time sitting in the tension and getting uncomfortable, right. And allowing there to be a tolerance towards the differences and so, and really, in childhood wise, when there's silence and there's a gap, like, that becomes safety and disconnection for people. Like it becomes, sure. Like there's very little teaching unless you're in the five percent of people in this world of how do you be in the conflict and stay connected. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, how are you, how are you teaching that? Because it's really difficult when you, your first imprint within your system is to avoid or to attack. Right. Yeah. Well, the first thing is slow down. Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, on the real practical level, it's as people are escalating or getting disconnected, even if it's happening in session. I mean, I, if there's a phrase that I've used over, you know, my almost 10 years of being a working as a therapist, I I have probably said slow down Mm a hundred thousand times. Right. I mean, it's multiple times a session. Right. And really what you're trying to get people to do is recognize what's going on in their body. So part of the work mm-hmm. that I also do is, is affect regulation, right? So affective body work and helping people actually slow down and understand physiologically the emotion that they're experiencing in their body. Yeah. Can you give an example of affect regulation, help people kind of understand the power of, of having awareness of your physiological sensations? Yeah. So there's a, there's a diagram that I hand to all my clients. If this is part of the work that we're doing Um, in your body, there's, and we'll keep it simple, right? So we'll talk about anxiety, fear, anger, sadness, and then we can call joy or peace or comfort. That's positive. So whatever you want to call that is, is okay. Mm -hmm. But in your body, uh, we'll look at, well, first I want disclaimer. Anxiety is not an emotion, right? Right. Okay. So I think a lot of people, well, how are you feeling? It's anxiety is pre affect, mm-hmm. right? Anxiety keeps you stuck. Emote means to move. Mm-hmm. So other emotions have an, you have an experience in your, in your body and in your mind that actually transitions you or moves you into something else. Right. So we're going to look at those fear. Uh, there's the most common physiological response in your body is constrictive uh, constriction around your heart. Right. So when there's right. a, Deep threat or known threat, heart constricts, pumps blood out into your extremities so you can either fight back or run. Underneath that is anger, right? So anger is it's experienced as a surge of heat in your solar plex. It'll surge up into your shoulders and down through your arms and legs. If you think about it, when you get really frustrated or angry, the most uh, natural thing that you want to do is what? Punch someone in the throat. That's right. Punch someone in the throat. I don't even have to be angry to do that, by the way, but right. let's go with it. <laughs> Uh, underneath that sadness, most commonly experienced as a pit or hollowness in your gut. Uh, and then relief from any of those, uh, would be what we could call, you know, peace, comfort, joy. And, and the goal is, you know, a lot of the work that people need to do is slow down enough, literally slow down, take a deep breath, scan down into your body. Right. Cause if you're not aware of what those things are, you're just most likely going to remain in a reactive place. Mm-hmm. Right. So like I probably do this. I know when I started out learning this, uh, I would do it 30 or 40 times a day. Just pause, slow down, scan down to your body and start locating in your body what you're feeling. And I think I think there's a, a, a scriptural connection to this, too. Right. So we we spend a lot of um, time up in our minds, which are obviously powerful and we need them. Um, and there's plenty of scripture that points towards talking about your mind being, uh, you know, um, necessary to be engaged in to have self-control and to have Mm -hmm. wisdom and to have Mm -hmm. however like your heart is in your body like literally in your body yeah we don't spend a lot of time i think connecting those two things right so uh and it's interesting i think you can probably figure out quicker if you learn how to pay attention to what's going on in your body and what's really going on internally with that faster than you can if you just stay up in your mind trying to analyze it. 
Absolutely. So. Yeah. So, so once you explain that to somebody and they're paying attention to what they are experiencing, they're able to recognize mm -hmm. that they have tension in their shoulders and that they might have tightness in their jaw and that can mean something particular for them because it's very personal or can be personal. Then your, your next goal would be what? How would you, how do you teach regulation from there versus teaching the self-regulation versus teaching co-regulation? Sure. So if, if someone is describing an image, right? So they're, 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 there's an image that represents um, whatever it is, their, the belief that we might be working on. So um, when they're experiencing uh, identifying a certain image that's related to fear, they're going to have tightness in their chest, right? So part of there's certain, um, you know, as you picture this image and you feel this fear in your chest, here and now with me, is there anything that you're uh, worried about or anything that, or what are you most worried about here now in this moment, mm -hmm. right? You're getting them to slow down and recognize. So for fear, uh, they might be perceiving that there's some kind of threat or they're going into a conversation or we're going into something therapeutically that they're not, um, maybe they're not ready to do, right? So this fear is being activated in their body. But if you can get them to identify here and now with me in the room, and that's part of the attachment piece, Oh, that there's nothing actually, well, I'm worried that maybe you won't like me if I share this with you. I'm worried that maybe you won't, um, you'll abandon me if I tell you, you know, there's a host of all kinds of response. Mm -hmm. um, is you can get them to voice that. Uh, usually what happens if that doesn't actually occur between me and them, which it usually it never has, uh, that fear is going to drop somewhere else in their body, usually to sadness, right? So, um, here and now with me, you're most worried that maybe I won't like you if you share this story or that I'll mm -hmm. judge. Okay. Um, if they say we, yeah, I think that's true. I, I, I feel like that might be true, but I know in my mind that I don't think that'll happen. It's like, all right, so what is it like for you to be judged? Right. Where do you think that's going to drop? Yeah. And then for them to, to, is that kind of usually linked to a childhood memory first being judged? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So we go back to, well, I would feel, I would feel ashamed or, or maybe sad yeah. that I was being judged. Okay. So right. I want you to stay with that. What does that shame or that judgment feel like in your body? Mm -hmm. And then from that point, like there's a, you, you can do a float back technique or, you know, is there right. any experience or memory coming up connected to that feeling in your body mm -hmm. here and now, right? Yeah. And then a minute and then, then that might lead into some, that might lead into some trauma work. Mm -hmm. Right. So like that's um, a lot of the work that I'm, I do is very process oriented like that. Right. Uh, the majority of it is. I, I don't do a lot of, I would say, I mean, obviously I talk to mm -hmm. folks, but once something's been identified that we can use one of the protocols that I'm trained in, I almost immediately shift into the protocol. Right. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause you want, you want people to get better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so have you seen like the technique that you're using, like tell me what happens if a wife watches her husband and do what you just described, like that it's, it's just, it's a witnessing mm -hmm. of someone's process. What have you seen with their closeness or interaction after that? Yeah. What I'll try to do is I try to keep the, the spouse engaged if they're in the room, mm -hmm. but, but this is where the attachment piece comes into because they're having a new kind of experience with me. Mm -hmm in the room, which is a great, you know, a new bonding, secure attachment. But if their spouse is in the room too, is actually have them, you know, here and now, what's it like for you to share this with your spouse in the room, right? And then what's it like for your spouse, look to the spouse, what's it like for you to see your husband or your wife sharing this kind of vulnerability or working through this process, right? Yeah. And then you get them interacting with each other to where they can, they're in a place of vulnerability, they're forming a new bond of trust in that moment if they're able to articulate what it is that's going on with them and also what it is their experience of their spouse, right? Very often, yeah. well, I, this is, you know, probably more commonly if men are going through that experience and their wives are in the room, the wives are really excited and grateful, right? It's kind of an mm -hmm. odd thing that their husband, but they're seeing sides of their husband that absolutely they you know, oftentimes don't get to see. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's incredibly powerful and just such a healing path. Sure. To be able to be a part of something, you know, like that. 
Yeah. Does yeah, it, it? It's fun work. I don't, I mean, yeah. you know. Well, it's fun because you get to see people get better. Right. It's not cognitive behavioral. It is really getting to what the core is instead of just, you know, topping off something that's, that's ill, you go to the core of what caused it to be ill right? in the first place. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then again, they get the person agency over what's happening to them. Sure. Yeah. And that's how you get your power back. Yep. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, people, they can have those experiences in here, but they can also learn the affective work too. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. I, that's part of, of why I do it is because if they can get a hold of, um, you know, what's going on in their bodies and start to piece together, because, you know, I pieced together some of my story before I even knew what any of this was. Right. I didn't, I didn't piece together all of my story in my own therapy. Mm-hmm. Right. So I, I, I think part of it, I had the opportunity to go through some other experiences um, that just helped me really kind of deal with that stuff in, in that kind of emotional way. Uh, and then uh, add to it as I went through grad school. Yeah, absolutely. And that, I think that's part of it too, is it's not one modality. It's not just one thing you've learned. Like you got to put yourself in there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's got to be about, doesn't mean you have to share your story in the session, obviously. It doesn't be the self-disclosure. It is about knowing and having confidence in someone's process because you've been through the process. Right. Yeah, I, um, I like being, you know, I, I was a coach before, right? right. So uh, I'm not... And co- really good coaches, I don't think, just stand on the sideline, right? Yeah. So like I, it's like, let's all get on the court and let's play the game, right? And, mm-hmm. I, and I think that uh, these are some real experiential and practical ways to help people learn how to do that so that mm-hmm. they actually can go out and have the yeah. kind of life and marriage that they want. What are the similarities of being a basketball coach and being a therapist? Mm. Um, I think the the first one that comes to mind that's the most fulfilling would be that I get to be in kind of real life, real time with people. Mm-hmm. Um, and you get to see people develop too. I mean, obviously there's distinctions. I mean, working in helping a marriage restore infidelity or someone work through trauma isn't the same thing as helping a young man learn how to, you know, improve his jump shot. But uh, But to see their, their confidence grow, yeah. Um, and to see them like act that out once they're either coming back in the session the next week or uh, that's a very fulfilling um, part of this work for sure. I mean, I think I'm doing what I was created to do. So it's. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So, th- so this is, this is God speaking to you saying your life is not your own. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think on a, in the work setting, yes. I mean, I'm, I want to work with as many people as I can. Um, and I think, you know, at the end of the day, if, if marriages and families are intact, that's a huge piece of the fabric of our culture. Right. Mm -hmm. And if, if people can, you know, work through their mess and, you know, understand that their spouses have mess and that their kids are going to have some mess with them too, but everyone learn how to actually see it and confront it in a healthy way and put some things in place to do that practically, then, uh, I think the whole world gets a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. How how would you define relationship? Just relationship in general? Like, yeah, just the term relationship. What's your definition for that? Um, um, that's an interesting question. Healthy healthy emotional and physical bond between that's a good definition yeah well even even seeing this is why i think it's such a trick question when people ask us stuff like this is that when i think relationship i don't automatically think healthy Hmm. right so if you define a toxic relationship versus a healthy relationship sure you know and i think relationship is a byproduct all right, it's a byproduct of receiving. It's a byproduct of safety and connection. It's a byproduct of courage, mm-hmm. right? So I think it's really hard to define. Yeah, um, I, I, I like to to move in the 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 positive arena as much as I can, or the psychologically. So I, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, maybe if we define it as 
you know, healthy, what does a healthy, you know, marriage look like? I mean, one of the things I do with clients is I ask the miracle question, right? That's how I frame goals with clients. Yeah. And it's all, when you do that, it's really important from the, for the language of that to be generative, to be positive. Right. Um, so helping them really articulate it with their own words. Right. So we have a vision. I think that's creating a vision as well yeah. for, for, you know, what it would look like to be in a healthy right. marriage or healthy parenting yeah. or whatever. Yeah. You, you mentioned a lot of mentors and different people in your life prior to becoming a therapist. I, th- I do believe in, so I'm curious, who are the, who are the icons? Who are the people in the marriage therapy world mm-hmm. that stand out to you that you appreciate their research or their modalities or their, their in, in results in their books? Like anybody stand out to you? Yeah. Um, one of the most formative books, I think, in this going down the affective trail that I've gone down, uh, do you know Diana Fosha? What's the last name? Diana Fosha. Actually, I don't. It's a great uh, name, though. I like that. Yeah. Uh, the, her, one of her books, The Transforming Power of Affect, hmm. is, is where some of this, the, the affect in the body work modality comes from. Right. Uh, so that was, that was uh, very influential for me uh, mm-hmm. right out of grad school. Um, you mentioned the unwanted same-sex attraction, uh, Dr. Nicolosi, uh, his trauma work uh, and him piecing together. Because when you're looking at that specific issue, you're looking at attachment, you're looking at trauma, usually in the form of sexual abuse, and then you're looking at uh, some compulsive or addictive behaviors or patterns out of that. Mm-hmm. So uh, his work has, has been influential as well. And just to be clear, that some of his work can be transferred. It's not only working with people who deal with that specific issue. Right. Right. And we're just clarifying that. And that's important for me to clarify to the listeners that this is for people who have an attraction to the same gender and do not want that attraction. And this is not a statement about people who are gay, lesbian, non-binary or anything else. Right. You are loved exactly where you are and exactly who you are. So yeah. that's not what it's for people who are actually, Adam's a great resource for people who are actually, who don't want to be in that and are seeking something different. Correct. And and just to add on to that, um, I agree with you hundred uh, percent. It is purely looking at the things that have, they believe have affected their lives. And in the, the research with men and women in that world are, um, the, the attachment piece, the trauma piece, mm-hmm. and the addiction piece are all very prevalent. Yeah. Uh, so we work with them on those things. And then, yeah. So obviously, I assume you've studied a lot of attachment styles and Bowlby and Ainsworth yeah. and all that's been part of this because that's such a part of helping people understand childhood trauma, understanding what happens in marriages and why we're so different. Sure. Yeah. Study that. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I think for from the marriage work, um, although, uh, EFT, Sue Johnson has mm-hmm. read her books and, and yeah, hold me tight. Yeah, that's great. My wife and I read that in our first year of marriage together. And, yeah. um, so she's been a big influence. Uh, some of the, you know, EFT is not exactly designed for the initial phases of a lot of the, the marriage crisis work I do is working with couples through infidelity. So mm-hmm. EFT is, uh, not at the front end of that, not really designed well for, that process. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, so some of the, the, the work that I do with clients working in those scenarios in the marriage crisis and infidelity recovery actually comes a little bit out of some of the coaching world that I was in as well. Mm-hmm. So, um, I've, I've integrated, uh, you know, the backgrounds that I have and the experiences I've had to create some processes, uh, to hopefully deal with that. Well, I, I think it goes mostly well. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I think that's great. So anyone else has been influential for you that you want to, that you want to mention or books you'd recommend for those who are listening, who are in a marriage and are baffled? um, uh, uh, Actually, I'm glad you brought this back up. Uh, Kurt Thompson. Yes. Yes. Who was on this podcast for those of you who want to listen to him. uh, I was, I don't think I get jealous very often, but when I saw that you were to talk to him, I got a little jealous. Um, I, I, it makes me happy. I don't know why, but it does. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, you know, what's funny, Kim. So in all the books that you read in grad school, 
you know, they give you a list of all the required books, right. and all the recommended books. So when I was in school, Anatomy of the Soul was a recommended book. It wow. wasn't required. But I yeah. saw the title and I looked it up and I read it just on my own. And to this day, it's been, uh, I've probably referenced that book more than any other book. Oh, that's great. I've spoken with people. So yeah, yeah, his, yeah. his, so his work has been influential as well. All right. All right. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And for those of you listening, Harville Hendricks, who is also on this podcast, his wife, yeah. Dr. Helen LaKelly Hunt, Getting the Love You Want, huge book that was a breakthrough for people when it came to marriages. John and Julie Gottman are huge. Sure. Um, and so many others, so many other people. You just got to find what speaks to you. And then Adam, I think you take a mixture of so much of that and really help people to personalize it. Sure. Yeah, and I've recommended, you know, one or all of those books to couples yeah. over the years. Right. So, yeah. but well, that, I, you know, I yeah. think everyone married couples, you know, individuals, trauma, no trauma, ta you know, whatever need right. to read, uh, anatomy of the soul. I think. That's yeah. Great. So we're really going to focus on anatomy of the soul. Yeah. I will let Kurt, my personal friend know that you. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, I, you know, I, I actually got to hear him speak uh, at a conference a few years ago. So I was, it was nice, but yeah, he's very, um, likable and gentle and yeah there's no there's no ego there's no pretense yeah. like i really yeah. really appreciate that about him he was he has great influence on people because he's so authentic mm -hmm. yeah 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 okay anything else you want to say to people before i put you on the hot seat I don't think so. This was fun. Well, yeah, no, I've really enjoyed it. We've again, we are our past been parallel for so long, and yeah. um, we're both a part of IC Talks Ministry, but I haven't had the time to sit down and just talk like we did today. So I'm very appreciative. Uh, of yeah, that. I do. I've I've been waiting. It's you know, at some point, I know I'm going to get a chance to meet and talk to Kim, and so here we are. Definitely, definitely, and we'll get to meet in person. Not that Zoom calls aren't in person, because this is as personal as we get a lot of times these days. Right. So yeah. we'll we'll take yeah. it. Yep. All right, Adam, you've been great. I'm going to throw you in the hot seat real quick. Just some simple questions. What comes to mind first? First word that comes to mind when you hear the word connection. Um, together. Together. What's the most normal thing about you? Oh, man. Um, that's an... That's an odd question. The most normal thing about me. Uh, I think I'm fairly normal. I don't know. <laughs> like, um, the first thought, the first image that came to mind was that I, you know, if you're at home with us, I'm just running around dancing and acting silly with my kids. I don't know if that's normal. I don't know if that's a... That seems normal. I'm pretty, I think I'll, I, I have been told many times that I'm fairly intense and serious. Yeah. Uh, and so I think when people get to see me goofing around and playing around and, you know, I think that they're like, oh, he's, he's actually a fairly normal guy. He's not yeah. always about, you know, yeah, I like it. Psychology. Great. What is your biggest fear? Um, not living long enough to see my kids grow up. Oh, wow. That's a huge fear. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. All right. What surprises people the most about you? That I'm half Lebanese. Okay. I think, because it's not obvious. All right. What's your other half? Uh, just European. My mom is from uh, Eastern Europe. Her okay. background. Okay. I love it. All right. What surprises you the most about you? These are, who comes up with these questions? These are these are uh, uh, what surprises me the most about me. Uh, honestly, how much I I think I value uh, like my family. Honestly, mm. yeah, with what you've been through, yeah, that makes yeah, sense. That's I, a great yeah. answer. Yep. Yeah, great answer. All right, last question: If you had to give yourself a new name. What would it be? Um, the name Jason, for some reason, has always been 
I have a, one of my best friends' name is Jason. I've always, I don't know why. Just yeah, the name. I thought you would pick Captain to yeah. honor your wife. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I, I learned what Jason meant uh, years ago, uh, and it means healer. Yeah, that's very appropriate for you. So I don't know. Uh, but I love my name, though. I'll, you know, Adam, I'll, I love that name. So yeah, it's a great name. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This has been great. If people want to get in touch with you, they want to seek you therapeutically. They want to just learn more about you. Can you just throw out some ways, whether it's Facebook, Instagram handle, website, whatever it is? Yeah. Website's going to be um, the best. It's encountertransformation.com. Uh, and the name of the practice is the Corner Institute for Transformation. Uh, and the corner, that idea or image comes out of Mark chapter two. Oh, that's great. I was going to ask you about that. That's really yeah. good. Yeah. It's the, um, where the paralytic is on the road and Jesus is in a crowded home and they can't get to him and four friends pick him up, tear off the roof and lower their friend down on a mat. And Jesus tells him to get up and walk and his sins are forgiven and he get, he goes out into a new life. And so yeah. uh, I actually was reading at like 4 a.m. one morning in grad school and uh, when I moved to Charlotte and was trying to figure out what my role or our role is, is just to carry a corner. So that's why it's carry a corner. Yeah. Yeah. So y'all can remember that, that it's the corner because you're carrying a corner and that's all part of being a healer. All right. I think that's amazing. Yeah. Any yes. other ways that you want them to get in touch with you? Uh, no, I actually, I don't have Instagram anymore and I don't even know the last time I was on Facebook. So <laughs> <laughs> Well, the way Facebook has become, I'm sure people kind of completely understand that. Well, Jason Adam Fidel, not that that's his real name, but I made that up. Thank you for sharing your time and your absolute expertise and your personal story with us. It's just amazing. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kim. It was great. So the, all of you that were part of this, I know something happened today. You heard something from Adam that flipped your lid. And we also pray that you heard something to help you reconnect to who God says you really are. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Flip Your Lid with Kim Honeycutt. Please subscribe, rate, and share. You can find Kim on Facebook or Instagram at KB Honeycutt. To get an autographed copy of Kim's book, visit butyourmotherlovesyou.com. Remember, no matter what, treat yourself well today.